All right. Um, and so get, I'm just going to walk us through where the suture's going. It's going to start with these bases, then to these, the media, then to the consciousness that arises from the contact between the two. Then it's going to talk about the six contacts, which is that the eye meeting the light formation, the ear meeting the sound formation. So the, there are six types of contact. So again, the, the six consciousness has contact with dharmas or contact with ideas. That contact, that contact will produce six different sensations. Sensations was our second foundation, right? But this was also part of that sutra we read about all the sensations that the Buddha said, well, in, in one sutra, in one presentation, I said there were six kinds of sensations. Well, this is one of those presentations where there are six kinds of sensations, sensations of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and then thinking. I did want to talk about this really quickly, the six elements. This is an interesting addition to this. This is going to be, and um, let me check the time, make sure I'm not, yeah, got plenty of time. Something that's going on here that is helpful to know, and I, well, there, all of the sense organs, the eye, the ear, nose, tongue, body, and the brain, and all of the sense objects, so both the bases and the objects, are, I'm hesitant to say made of, made of is probably not a really good way to think of it, but the bases and the objects are both understood by way of form. And this is that word rupa. Let's see, rupa. So here's the thing about it is that this idea of form or shape, you know, and I always say this when I draw my guy here, how do you know that those are the eyes, right? Well, they have the form of eyes, right? Little round circles with little circles inside of them, right? How do you know that that's the nose? Little, you know, Picasso, little Picasso nose, right? Well, it has the form of a nose. As these have the form of ears. This word rupa or form is, is an interesting idea in Indian philosophy, but it's this idea that that how we know what things are is their shape or their form. And that's a kind of a, and that goes for sound too. We talk about sound waves. And if you're really in the business, you talk about wave formations, sound wave formations, and it's the formation of the wave that makes it this sound and not that sound, makes it this song and not that song. So this idea of the form is interesting. And I want you to know that all six sense bases and all six sense objects are again made of, understood by form. And form is traditionally made of the four great elements, earth, fire, water, and air. Or again, better to think of it not so much as made of those things as understood by those four things. Traditionally, earth is not necessarily dirt, but solidity. So it's the property of being solid, of having mass. That's usually the earth element is the property of solidity. The water element is the property of fluidity. So it's not necessarily H2O or a river or an ocean. It's just actual fluidness. Fire is traditionally temperature, so not necessarily a fire that will burn you, but the idea that everything in the known tangible universe world has a temperature, whether it's cold, whether it's very cold, or whether it's very hot, it has a temperature, and that temperature is a measure of the so-called fire element. And then the fourth element, wind or air, 
Again, not necessarily H2O air, or sorry, not just necessarily oxygen or nitrogen, uh, but air is actually sort of the life element. And it, air or wind is about movement, is something self-moving. Does it move of its own? If something moves on its own, we would call it alive or something like that. And in the traditional Indian philosophy or way of thinking, that element of movement, that element of animation, of being alive, is the air element. And so all tangible existence can be understood as a combination of those four elements in varying degrees. And so if something is very cold, not moving, very solid and not very fluid, it might be a rock, right? And you can sort of measure the whole, everything and every object based on the combination of those four elements. Those are only four elements though, and those are the four elements that make up this tangible world of form. The fifth element in this series is actually space, akasha. And we've talked, or I've talked a lot about space. It's a very, uh, very, very subtle element. It is not an object, it is not a thing. Um, it is, I often describe space as an element. It's nice to think of space as an allowance, meaning that space is what allows for things to exist, but it itself is not locatable. Again, it's not tangible, it's not transferable or transmutable in that way. Just for tonight, because it'll be helpful to the sutra later on, here's a, here's a fun way to think of space. Uh, I use a lot of different examples to try to describe space. Um, if you're in front of a laptop or a cell phone, right? There's a way of thinking of that laptop or that cell phone as an object in space, right? An object in space. And your, or your cell phone, whatever you're watching this on, is an object in space. Now, if you were to think about the space that that object occupies, right, in front of you or what have you, well, the space that it occupies is what makes it it and not the lamp that's next to it or not the whiteboard that's next to that because that's in that space, right? The lamp's in that space. The, the laptop is in this space, right? So here's the fun little, little game, little mind exercise to get you to think about space. What if I asked you now to consider the battery inside your laptop or the battery inside your cell phone? right? Well, something very interesting happened there, which is that in order, in order for your mind, in order for you to conceive of the laptop and the battery, you had to make space between them. You had to separate them. But a minute ago, they were the same thing because I was just talking about the laptop in the singular, which included the battery, the keys, the screen, and all of this stuff, right? But if I asked you to consider the battery unto itself, your mind needs to uh, make room. It needs to create space inside the laptop and separate the battery from the laptop and therefore create a space between them. So what space is, is this really, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's this infinite well, because again, it's nowhere. It can, you can have as much of it as you would like, which is really interesting, but it is a function of consciousness. It's actually, space has this really intimate relationship with consciousness because consciousness relies on or uses space to then, oh, you mean the battery and the laptop, gotcha. There are two different things now. And if you wanted to start talking about the keys on the laptop as different than the laptop, you would have to make space between each of them. And indeed, there is space between each of them. 
But again, I just want you to see how that space was sort of always there, right? But when it was just the single laptop, the space collapsed into one thing. So again, it's just this really subtle, interesting relationship between consciousness and space, where space is the allowance that allows for the mind to then populate space with objects and things and then think about them and not in a way get them all mixed up as one, right? So the six elements are the four elements of form, space, and consciousness. Consciousness is the sixth element in this category, right? Any questions about these 36 dharmas before we move on? Good. Yeah. Uh, two more quick dharmas that it's going to talk about, and then more or less I'm going to dive into the sutta. The, uh, after it goes through these six sixes, it's going to talk about the five skandhas. This is a basic Buddhist idea. I do Dharma talks on this almost every night, it seems. But the basic idea of Buddhism, of course, is that this, um, this agent, the sentient being or the self, while the body of form is made of six sense organs, what makes this being what makes this conglomeration sort of unique, unique as thinking it's Michael, right? I'm trying to avoid some sort of ego self thing here. So it's just this idea that what the experience of being me, the experience of being a being or being Michael in this sense, while it seems to be singular, Michael, it's just one thing, just me. For the Dharma of Buddhism, there's actually five aggregates, aggregation, five skandhas, as they're called, these five aggregates coming together. And that is that we are made of form, which is the bodily organs, the body itself, matter. We are our bodily form, but it's constantly changing. We are the particular sensations we're having at any given moment. We are also our unique form of perception. We are our unique form of conditioning. And ultimately, we are that consciousness or actually all six consciousnesses firing at once. Important point, important point about perception and conditioning. They too exist and are operating in each of the organs themselves, meaning that the sense organ of the eye, after coming into contact with repeated forms of light and shadow, develops a sense of perception. Oh, I've seen, I've seen something that looks like a cone that has the little balls of drippy stuff on top of it. I've seen that before. That's an ice cream cone. Well, the eyeball itself has a perception and it's through that buildup of perceptions that it's able to provide the sixth consciousness with an idea of the ice cream cone to begin with. Samskara or this mental conditioning, this is more about emotion. This is more about how this ice cream cone makes you feel but again, I want you to know that each of the organs are conditioned through repeated interactions with things. And every single time I saw one of these things that looked like this and tasted like that, it made me happy. It was a pleasant experience. So I have built up in all of my organs, in particular, the tongue, I have built up a conditioned response to sweet that i like it i like it michael really likes it and so the idea here is again is that these um this way of thinking of the psychology of the individual that what this is 
is a unique form of conditioning, a unique sense of consciousness, a unique, all of that. And so the uniqueness, which is that these eyes, these ears, this nose has experienced the things that it has experienced and therefore built up these conditionings, these perceptions with these sensations based on this form, that's what all starts to allow for the sense of individuality and uniqueness in that way. But what we're going to be talking about tonight with the sutra is sort of dismantling that illusion that arises from these six sense organs uh, dancing together. So the five aggregates here, again, they're taking place in each of the six organs, uh, not just the, the brain. And then finally, the last piece of this, the sutra is going to talk about the four formless realms, but these are the realm of infinite space, consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. This really almost non-dualistic state of kind of neither nor, right? That's the fourth of, fourth of these. But these four formlessnesses, infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, infinite neither perception nor non-perception, I want you to be very aware that they are ayatanas. These four formlessnesses are ayatanas. And that's, it's really subtle, but it's really important to think about that these four formlessnesses, infinite space becomes an ayatana. Remember, an ayatana was the base like your eyeball, like your ear, your nose, your tongue, your body, your brain. Those were the bases. Those were the ayatanas. At this level of meditation, the ayatana is no longer the eye, no longer the nose, no longer the brain. The ayatana itself is infinite space. So the actual base itself is no longer the brain, no longer the eye or the ear. It's actually space itself crazy crazy idea i know but i just needed to get you all the way through all of that those are all the dharmas that are going to be discussed should be a little clearer now uh or should be clearer now when they pop up what's being discussed michael uh <coughs> question yeah. here please hey. hi Jean-François. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's a different list of dharmas than the Sati Patana, you know, the fourth foundation in the Sati Patana, where there's also, if I recall, like five hindrances, seven uh, factors of enlightenment, four noble truths, etc. So is it just a question of focus here, or you know, because or mm -hmm. are these more important dharmas, or what's yep. why is there a discrepancy? Basically, uh, were you by any chance here or have listened to last week? Yes. Okay. So if you remember, last week I made a point that the, four found, the Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness, they focus on a greedy state of mind, a hate-filled state of mind, a deluded state of mind, contracted, distracted, you know, mm -hmm. those specific mind states. But the point I made last week was, yeah, it focuses on those, but fear, love, all, all these other things are mind states too. Right, and the same degree of mindfulness could and should be paid to those mind states as well. So, the idea being that, yeah, the, in the Satipatthana, he lists those particular mind states, and yeah, those are important mind states, but they're not the only mind states. Mm -hmm. In very similar fashion, the Satipatthana Sutta focuses on those particular dharmas. But the whole process is to be able to understand all the dharmas. Hmm. Yeah. Right and, and tonight, in particular, the dharma of the six sense bases. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can, can I ask a question? Sorry. Of, of course. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, can you repeat what the four form, formless realms were again? Space. Mm-hmm. Consciousness, vijnana, nothingness, 
And then the fourth is neither perception nor non-perception. Neither samya nor no samya. So the word's actually samya, and it's talking about neither samya nor na samya. Thanks. Yep. All right. I think we're about to dive into the sutra. Uh, I still have preliminary remarks on the sutra itself, not just the dharmas that are going to go on in it. Um, two things. Very, uh, I'll start with a story and then a little more dharma. Uh, here's the story. Tonight's sutra takes place in the Jetavana, uh, otherwise known as Anathapindika's Park. And I wanted to very quickly tell you the story because I didn't know when, it, when, when I would get the chance uh, other than now to tell you. We've read so many suttas and even Mahayana, Buddhist, uh, Mahayana sutras that take place in, in the great city of Shravasti in the Jetavana, otherwise called Anathapindika's Park. And the story of that is, is that I mentioned last week that, you know, Anatha Pindika was, a, was considered the wealthiest person in all of Shravasti. He was considered the wealthiest guy. Uh, last sutra, last week, is when the, he met the Buddha, got all excited, became a follower of the Buddha. And the story is, is that prior to meeting Anatha Pindika, the Buddhists, the Sangha, they just wandered the earth. Just wherever they found themselves, that's where they slept that night. And the part of it was homeless. Part of the deal was being homeless. Well, it turns out that Anathapindika, um, in giving the monks money for robes, not money, but giving them material for robes, giving them food, giving them offerings, he wanted to buy them a place to hang out. He wanted to buy them a monastery, essentially, or what would become a monastery. And so there was a prince named Jetta, J-E-T-A, in the city of Shavasti, and he had a giant uh, mango grove. And there's a story that basically Anatha Pindika said to Jetta, hey, I want to buy your mango grove to donate it to the Buddha and his Sangha. And Jetta said, yeah, sure, you can have it. I'll give it to you for all the gold it takes to cover the ground. And Anatha Pindika said, great, hold on. And he went and got wheelbarrows and wheelbarrows of gold. And supposedly the story actually was that, that Jetta was like, no, 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 I was just kidding. I don't want to sell my, I don't want to sell it. I was just kidding. But the story is that there was a, um, a practice or a tradition in India at the time that if somebody set a price for something, and you met it, they had to sell it to you. Like it was sort of an implicit standard of bar, uh, bar, bartering and bargaining that if somebody said, I'll give it to you for this and you got that, they couldn't renege. And so Anatha Bendika said, no, 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 you can't renege. And he, the story says that he literally put gold coins and covered the entire ground of the mango grove. Uh, and then there's a story too that Jetta, he was so, uh, Prince Jetta was so moved by Anatha Pindika's generosity that he too je uh, donated um, uh, an extra portion of land that became the gateway to the Jetavana. So there's a whole story with that. So that's where this story takes place. And this Anatha Pindika's park or the Jetavana, I've, I've said this before, more more suttas, more teachings of the Buddha take place in the Jetavana than anywhere else. It seems to have been the Buddha's sort of favorite number one place to stop and stay for the rainy season retreat, the three month long retreat and all of that. Um, and so, and since this is the sutra that is the advice to Anathapindika, it would make sense that it starts in the Jetavana. But not only that, this uh, sutra will ultimately be an, an ode, an ode to the Jetavana. So just wanted to point that out. And I think I'm ready to start reading. 
Yep, I just have one, two, two more. Sorry, two more Dharma points. Um, the first Dharma point, and this is this is a kind of a it's a serious point. Um, you know when the when the Buddha Siddhartha the the prince Siddhartha, um, you know when he first decided to set off seeking enlightenment, there were supposedly these, um three sites, sometimes four sites, but three things that he saw that he was exposed to that propelled him to seek enlightenment. And they were old age, sickness, and death. He saw an old person that he had never seen before with gray hair, age, wrinkled, that whole thing. Uh, he saw a sick person and he had never seen a sick person before. And he saw a corpse, and he had never seen a corpse before. And it was upon seeing these sights that the Buddha resolved to find, to find a way out of old age, sickness, and death. And in many ways, that is the Dharma. That's the Dharma. What is Buddhism? What is the Buddha's Dharma? It is a path for transcending old age, sickness, and death. And the reason why I mention that is that this sutra tonight, it's, it's a serious sutra because uh, Anathapindika is sick. Anathapindika is very sick. Uh, in fact, he's dying. And I think that this, you know, sutra, with everything that's going on right now, is, it's, it's relevant. It's always relevant, of course, these, these concerns these things old age sickness and death they're always with us humankind has faced these you know it's part of being human right so i kind of you know in reading the sutra getting ready for tonight i was kind of like wow this is kind of heavy he's sick you know it's like that's a heavy topic but as buddhists or dharma practitioners we certainly shouldn't shy away from what the Buddha is talking about, which is how transcending old age, sickness, and death. And so this is a sutra tonight for, in particular, transcending sickness and death. And it's a particular uh, prescription. It's a particular type of medicine tonight, which of how to do that. So I just wanted to kind of preface that with that, that that's what we're really dealing with is a sort of a serious sutra with Anatha Pindika being very sick. And the final, before I read it, and it's really short, it's only a few pages, so it shouldn't take that long. But the last thing is, the, in addition to all these dharmas that are gonna get referenced, there's gonna be this one key idea, and I wanna make sure that we're all very clear about what it means. And it's gonna be this word, clinging. In fact, Shariputra, who's, who's actually de delivering the discourse tonight, Shariputra, not the Buddha, interestingly, Shariputra is going to keep using this word or keep talking about not clinging, not clinging to. And, you know, this is something I talk about a lot. It's what most Dharma teachers spend a lot of time talking about, which is non-attachment or not clinging. And I just wanted to make it clear my interpretation of this, the way that I teach this Dharma, not clinging. In all, a lot of my Dharma talks lately, I've been using this, this word of disposition having a disposition towards things, in, in particular, the disposition of ownership. So you can think about how you stand, right? What is your disposition towards those objects that you consider that you own? Maybe the responsibility you for, feel for those things that you own, the, the problem you might have if somebody took that thing that you consider that you own or whatever. But I just want you to see that it's, it's in the disposition. It's in the mentality of the ownership, right? The, the actual object, it, it could be in a, you know, it could be in a, in a storage facility. It could be, it, it could be an idea, you know, it could be whatever. So the clinging is not necessarily this kind of um, physical, uh, it, it, yeah, it can manifest that way. And it does often as a physical, an actual physical clinging where somebody 
you know, is trying to take your thing and you're holding on to your thing for dear life, right? So that's clinging. But tonight, and, and again, for me, usually it's help, more helpful to think of it as this, this atta- a mental attachment to things, a kind of, as if all the organs, not just, not just the mind, but as if the eyes and the ears had little hands, you know, and I, um, I often also use the, the analogy, not the analogy or just the example of being at a sports bar or being at a, at a bar that has a lot of screens, a lot of uh, television screens, right? And that, that, odd, uh, that odd thing where you find yourself staring at it, and even though you may not even be a sports fan or whatever, but you kind of find yourself uh, attached to it. Well, that's the I being dazzled and stimulated and then therefore kind of clinging to the screen. Even though you don't, you, the, even though the mind might be going like, this is dumb. Why am I watching this? But your eyes delighted or something to that effect. And so I just want you to, when Shari Putra keeps mentioning this word clinging, I want you to kind of think of it as that more subtle disposition of whether it's ownership or, or just unavoidable clinging to it. And so the, the Dharma or the teaching will be to not do that. And what will be relevant, of course, is that like in a sports bar where you kind of do it uncontrollably, that's where it becomes a practice of mindfulness, of, of getting on top of these things and being like, oh, wow, I've been watching this screen now for 20 minutes and I didn't even like it. You know, so again, that's the subtle clinging. All right. Sutra time. All right, I was just reading some comments. You all are so great. Let's read the sutra. All right, so any questions before I start? Because I would like to just go through this. I'm going to try very hard not to do the thing I do, which is stop and explain when I've said I'm not going to do that. So, but I do think I covered all the points. And so, please, uh, just kick back, relax. And here we go with the Anatha Pindikovada Sutta. Advice to Anatha Pindika. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One, the Buddha, was living in Shravasti, in the Jetavana Anatha Pindika's park. Now, on that occasion, the householder, Anatha Pindika, was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. Then he addressed a certain man thusly, Come, good man, go to the Blessed One, pay homage in my name with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the householder Anatha Pindika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Blessed One's feet. Then go to the Venerable Shariputra, pay homage in my name with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the householder Anatha Pindika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Venerable Shariputra's feet. Then say, It would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Venerable Shariputra would come to the residence of the householder Anatha Pindika, out of compassion. Yes, sir, the man replied. And he went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to the Buddha, he sat down at one side and delivered his message. Then he went to the Venerable Shariputra, and after paying homage to the Venerable Shariputra, he delivered his message, saying, It would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Venerable Shariputra would come to the residence of the householder Anatha Pindika out of compassion. The Venerable Shariputra consented in silence. Then the Venerable Shariputra dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went to the residence of the householder Anatha Pindika with the Venerable Ananda at his, as his attendant. Having gone there, he sat down on a seat made ready, made ready for him and said to the householder Anatha Pindika, 
I hope you are getting well, householder. I hope that you are comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing, and that, and that their subsiding, not their increase, is apparent. Venerable Shariputra, Anatha Pindika replied, I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. Just as if a strong man were splitting my head open with a sharp sword, so two violent winds cut through my head. I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. Just as if a strong man were to tighten a tough leather strap around my head as a headband, so too there are violent pains in my head. I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. Just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife, so too violent winds are carving up my belly. I'm not getting well. I'm not comfortable. Just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals, so too there is a violent burning in my body. I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. Then the Venerable Shariputra said, Then householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the I, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the I. Thus you should train. You should train thus. I will not cling to the ear, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the ear. I will not cling to the nose, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the nose. I will not cling to the tongue, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the tongue. I will not cling to the body, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the body. I will not cling to the mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the mind. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to visible forms. I will not cling to sounds. I will not cling to odors. I will not cling to flavors. I will not cling to tangibles. I will not cling to dharmas, to mind objects. And my consciousness will not be dependent on mind objects or dharmas. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the eye consciousness. I will not cling to ear consciousness. I will not cling to nose consciousness. I will not cling to tongue consciousness. I will not cling to body consciousness. I will not cling to mind consciousness. And my consciousness will not be dependent on mind consciousness. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to eye contact. I will not cling to ear contact. I will not cling to nose contact. I will not cling to tongue contact. I will not cling to body contact. I will not cling to mind contact. And my consciousness will not be dependent on mind contact. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to sensations born of eye contact. I will not cling to sensations born of ear contact. I will not cling to sensations born of nose contact. I will not cling to sensations born of the tongue contact. I will not cling to sensations born of bodily contact. I will not cling to sensations born of mind contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on sensations born of mind contact. Thus you should train.
householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the earth element. I will not cling to the water element. I will not cling to the fire element. I will not cling to the air element. I will not cling to the space element. I will not cling to the consciousness element. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the consciousness element. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to material form. I will not cling to sensations. I will not cling to perceptions. I will not cling to conditioned formations. And I will not cling to consciousness. And my consciousness will not be dependent on consciousness. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the base of infinite space. I will not cling to the base of infinite consciousness. I will not cling to the base of nothingness. I will not cling to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to this world. And my consciousness will not be dependent on this world. I will not cling to the world beyond. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the world beyond. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought after, and examined by the mind. And my consciousness will not be dependent on that which is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought after, and examined by the mind. Thus, you should train. When this was said, the householder Anatha Pindika wept and shed tears of joy. Then the venerable Ananda asked him, Are you foundering, householder? Are you sinking? And Anatha Pindika replied, I am not foundering, Venerable Ananda. I am not sinking. But although I have long waited upon the teacher and monks worthy of esteem, never before have I heard such a talk on the Dharma. Shariputra replied, actually Ananda replied, such talk on the Dharma householder is not given to the lay people clothed in white robes. Such talk on the Dharma is given only to those who have gone forth. Well then, Venerable Shariputra, let such talk on the Dharma be given to lay people clothed in white robes. There are clansmen with little dust in their eyes who are wasting away through not hearing such talk on the Dharma. There will be those who understand this Dharma. Then, after giving the householder Anatha Pindika this advice, the Venerable Shariputra and the Venerable Ananda rose from their seats and soon departed. After they had left, the householder Anatha Pindika died and reappeared in the Tushita heaven. Then, when the night was well advanced, Anatha Pindika, now a young god of beautiful appearance, went to the Blessed One, illuminating the whole of the Jedavana. And after paying homage to the Blessed One, he stood at one side and addressed the Buddha in stanzas, saying, <clears throat> O blessed is this Jedavana, dwelt in by the sagely Sangha, wherein resides the king of the Dharma, the fount of all my happiness. By action, knowledge, and Dharma, by virtue and noble way of life, 
by these are mortals purified, not by lineage or by wealth. Therefore, a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate these dharmas and purify himself with them. Shariputra has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and wisdom's ways. Any monk who has gone beyond, at best, can only equal him. That is what the young god Anathapindika said, and the teacher approved. Then the young god Anathapindika, thinking, the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to the Blessed One, and keeping him on his right, vanished at once. When the night had ended, the Blessed One addressed the monk, saying, Bhikkhus, last night, when the night was well advanced, there came to me a certain young god of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of the Jetavana. After paying homage to me, he stood at one side and addressed me in stanzas, saying, O blessed is this Jetavana, dwelt in by the sagely Sangha, wherein resides the king of the Dharma, the fount of all happiness. By action, knowledge, and Dharma, by virtue and noble way of life, by these are mortals purified, not by lineage or by wealth. Therefore, a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate the Dharma and purify himself with it. Shariputra has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and wisdom's ways. Any monk who has gone beyond, at best, can only equal him. That is what the young god said. Then the young god, thinking, the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to me, and, keeping me on his right, vanished at once. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Buddha, Surely, Venerable Sir, that young god must have been Anathapindika, for the householder Anathapindika had perfect confidence in the Venerable Shariputra. Good, good, Ananda. As far as reasoning goes, you have drawn the right conclusion. That young god was Anathapindika and no one else. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. And there you have it. Questions, ideas, comments? Quick, quick question, Michael. Yo. Uh, during Anathapindika's recitations, he says, by action, knowledge, and what was the last? Dharma. Dharma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are vi are, and and by action, knowledge, and Dharma are virtue and a noble way of life attained? Is that, is that the, what's what the language again? So that is the, in my opinion, the, the most interesting part of this sutra. Mm. It speaks volumes about the nature of Buddhism in the history of India. Mm. He says that by one's actions, by one's knowledge, and by the Dharma, by virtue and the noble way of life, that's mm. how mortals are purified. Right. Not by lineage or wealth. Right. And this is responding to a culture in which one's social status and one's wealth were indicative of salvation, were mm. indicative of purification. Mm. And the, the Dharma, the Buddhist Dharma and the whole actual Buddhist um, movement is kind of famous for being counter caste. Right all of that that and so that speaks to that no yeah and, and revolutionary <laughs> in that or it just kind of flips it um and and sort of 
part in the word democratizes, you know, but like it makes it egalitarian where it has nothing to do with caste, social standing, wealth, but really w merit, you know, action, knowledge, dharma, that it can be done, right? We, it can be accomplished by whosoever sort of undertakes the, the path kind of a thing, right? That's the idea. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that stanza out. Yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Any other comments, questions, or ideas? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Um, because when you were going through the, um, the bases and objects and consciousnesses, it was reminding me of the links in the chain of dependent arising. Yeah. I was wondering, is there, is there a connection there? You know, the, the connection that I am inclined to, to, to point out now is not so much this like i mean yeah it, you, it, the language there's talking about dependency right that these um that i shall not cling to these things so that my thinking my sight will not be dependent on the things of this world right so we are talking about dependency and in that sense dependent origination but for me actually what's I think what's more interesting about the relate with contact leading to sensation and all of that is that, you know, the Buddha's a broken record, you know, he's, he's this dharma, this dharma, he's, you know, he's got this, he's trying to say this thing and he says it all these different ways. And so when these ideas pop up, it's because, you know, these are the fundamental ideas to be wrestling with. And not necessarily, you know, a connection with the twelve link chain of causation. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably more helpful in this case that both the discourse on the twelve link chain of causation and this discourse are interested in the bases and interested in contact and sensations arising from the contact. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And if I may on that, I wanted to point out an, another interesting thing about the, this teaching tonight. This idea of, of um, having the sense organs and then having vision be dependent on light formations from the outside world. There is one tradition, and there's parts of Buddhism that observe this tradition. There's one way to not do that, to not uh, be dependent on visual forms. It looks like this. <laughs> Close your eyes. <laughs> uh, that's it, you, you cut them off right there. And yeah, there's sutras that talk about the black that you're looking at behind your eyes and da 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 da. But there's one tradition that is talking about receiving that. And so, oh, great, let's just close it. And there's a tradition of putting um, basically your fingers in your ears, blocky, blocky, blocky. You block all the sense doors. And so it's like a sensory deprivation tank. And voila, no more dependency on them. And then we just have to work on those, that, right? But what's interesting about this sutra and the whole Buddhist enterprise is that they're talking about doing it with your eyes open. And that's referring to my sports bar analogy which is that it's the mind that doesn't get stuck it are the eyes that don't get stuck on the screen the eyes that are in control of themselves shall we say and so if i may use the language of the buddha if i may use the language of the sutra so that no dust settles there's this beautiful metaphor in Buddhism where he says about people having dust on their eyes. That's people with the sports bar screens on their eyes. And it's difficult to hear the Dharma when the Super Bowl is going on. Right. And so again, I, I, I like to stress that one way is to close the eyes, but it's a much more interesting, profound practice to be seeing hearing smelling but without clinging and that is the advice that's the advice to anatha pindika don't cling to that which is dying don't cling to that which is suffering don't don't 
cling. That's the advice. Michael, I don't understand. You just brought up, I had a question. When, 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 the, when the sutra mentions clansmen with little dust in the eyes, is that, what is the reference there for the dust? Is that that the eyes are sort of clear and, and they're sort of purified or something? Or is it that the dust is kind of keeps you from engaging the object? I'm not, I'm not really sure. What, what, what is that saying? So in the very, very first sutta, the very, very first teaching of the Buddha, um, and actually, it's not even the very first teaching of the Buddha. It's the story about the first teaching of the Buddha. Apparently, he was ready to go right off into Parinirvana. He was like, yeah, see ya. And a god, a Brahma god, came down and, and begged the Buddha and said, no, 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 you got to tell some people about this. And that Brahma god said to the Buddha, there are people in this world with little dust in their eyes and they'll be able to get it and get, they'll be able to get rid of rid of the rest of the dust the the metaphor is actually i mean it's interpreted of course so many but the way it's understood is like whether it's visual forms sounds sense taste bodily or mind it is about having attachment to little things in this world and therefore being defiled by that. Right. And so those who have, they're not attached to much in this world. They have little dust in their eyes. So they just need that little push or, you know, and then they're, and so they're evoking the same language here, Anatha Pindika, by saying there's, there's householders who have little dust in their eyes. They need right. to hear this. Right. Mm, right on. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments, ideas? I just have uh, one last comment, but. All right. So, um, you, so right now, what's happening in my Dharma doors here? is that we have our four foundations of mindfulness that is like the it's like a fading backbeat right and what i'm bringing the fader up on is getting ready for the next sutra that we're going to be doing which is our vimalakirti our famous vimalakirti sutra we're going to be talking about this vimalakirti sutra next time and I have made some interesting Dharma discoveries recently. And so what's happening here is that Anatta Pindika, in particular, this sutra appears to be the, the model or the foundation for the Vimalakirti Sutra that we're going to be reading. And what I mean by that is, is that this whole sutra, which is about a famous lay white robed wearing rich dude, this whole sutra is about he's sick, he's ill, and it's about the monks going to pay him a visit. Now, it'll be interesting because in this sutra, it's the sick guy that gives the discourse to the monks, not Shariputra, the monk, giving the discourse. So it's going to be flipped, but I want you to know that the references are many to this sutra. So we're bring, again, we're bringing up the fader on our Vimalakirti by making this connection with Anatha Pindika that, you know, that the sutra got a little wild at the end there, right? He, he dies, but he becomes a god and then comes back. And so the, that type of um, oh, what do I want to call that? You know, that, that type of poetics at the end of the sutra are, again, they're going to, they're going to play into this later sutra. And so the, uh, yes, I wanted to do this sutra because it's an amazing Dharma discourse. It's sort of awesome. But I also wanted to introduce this motif of the sick householder going to see him 
Shariputra, not the Buddha. So it's an interesting sutra too, because it's not the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't give the discourse. It's a monk. So you already have a precedent for, uh, what would be the word? Empowerment, I guess would be sort of the word, but the, the, uh, a, a precedent for em empowering others to teach the Dharma. So again, all of these little ideas that are going to be popping up as we move into the next sutra. So just wanted to share all of those little points with you. And that as we do move into this, I will probably reference this sutra often. So, Michael, uh, will you use uh, Burton Watson for as the basis for this or uh, Thurman? I'm going... You don't need that's to a, answer. <laughs> that's, a, no, no, that's a great, it's a great question. I will probably be doing both. Actually, I will, you know, I, I have been working on my own translation of Imalakirti, oh. which of course, like any good scholar uses all existing translations as references. So uh, you're going to probably get a fresh translation that's based on both. Hey. Yep. And on that note, by the way, uh, not, uh, let's see, it's not this Thursday or next, but Thursdays in April, Michael Taft is doing a series of Vimalakirti meditations, and we're actually tag teaming. So I'm going to do the chapter and read it and explain it. And then the following Thursday, if you tune in, he's going to be doing a meditation based on that teaching. So that'll be really fun. Um, and if you don't know Michael Taft, he, he leads some pretty wild uh, meditations uh, that'll be really interesting to see his take on, on the Vimalakirti. So that's all I got, folks. Thank you, Michael. My that pleasure. That was great. Amazing sutra. Thank you. Thank you I was going to um, share with everyone part of what you just shared, which is Vimalakirti duet. I think of them as duets, asynchronous nice. duets. You and you and Taft will be starting that next week. And then um, remember that this week um, that Mimi is still doing the Satipatthana on Tuesday, if you can yep. join us for that. Um, Katie just put the donation link in the, in the chat. And uh, if you can, please donate. And if you can't, we love you being here, that you're donating your presence and your, and your participation in this. So, you know, we're entering, I think week one and a half to two of online Dharma. It's been an amazing experiment. And uh, we're just so appreciative of all of you for being here and of you, Michael, for your amazing teaching. And um, I hope everyone is staying well. Join us for all the, everything's online, like all the classes, Taft to morning sits to even Chandra on Wednesdays. So keep it, keep it coming, everyone. Stay safe and sane. Thank you for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, oh, Thanks so much, Michael. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Oh, my, my pleasure. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye.